Hello, I'm Legendary and this is Star Wars Jedi Survivor, the Souls-like follow-up to Fallen Order. It was developed by Respawn Entertainment and published by EA. There's a lot going on with this one. I'm sure by now you've probably heard the news about the sad technical state that this game released in. It mostly seems relegated to the PC side due to the variations in hardware, but the console versions are not without flaw either. If you're wary of games that are buggy or broken to a large extent, I would tell you to wait to check out Star Wars Jedi Survivor because, yeah, it's a mess that needs fixing. With that said, I'm going to use most of this first impression style video to cover the game itself and not agonize over all of the technical issues present. This is your cue to check your baggage at the door. So, when we last left off with Cal Kestis, he and his crew of misfits had found the Holocron containing a list of Force-sensitive younglings scattered across the galaxy, with whom they could begin a new order of Jedi. But in the end, Cal and his friends decide that the next generation's continued existence and safety from the Empire should be prioritized over their own desires to tear it down. The Holocron is destroyed, and the team moves on. At the start of Jedi Survivor, there's a pretty cool video that summarizes the events from the first game. It doesn't go over everything in extreme depth, but it gets the job done and has some very stylish animation that hypes you up for the new installment. We catch up with Cal and his adorable droid pal BD-1 five years later as they deceitfully maneuver their way aboard a corrupt senator's yacht in the underbelly of Coruscant to fetch some information. Things go sideways, as all best laid plans typically do, and the remaining members of his new crew are forced to flee with the data in hand, but not before confronting the Ninth Sister, a former Jedi turned Inquisitor that players of the first game should be pretty familiar with. After an explosive exit, Cal's ship, the Mantis, is left with damage that he can't repair alone. This sets him on the path to seek out his old crewmates and figure out what his future holds. While the big set pieces and the action got me prepped for a fun adventure, I don't feel like they really nailed the narrative hook here. It feels kind of directionless for a while, as the plot takes time to set up ideas and characters that don't really add much to it. The story does pick up some more steam once you leave Coruscant, but I didn't get heavily invested in what was happening until I was ready to move on from the following planet. To be honest, I never got around to finishing Fallen Order. I remember going to Dathomir for a second time and recruiting Marin, which means I probably got through about half of it. So after watching another YouTube video to get myself set up to speed on the ending of the story, I dove into Jedi Survivor with no real expectations besides more Star Wars. There's also a light novel that takes place between the events of both games called Battle Scars that covers a mission the original crew goes on. The main points you need to know get exposited in Cal's dialogue in the first couple hours of Survivor, so it isn't a necessary read unless you really want to. I remember from my first time playing Fallen Order that the story was interesting, but I had other games on my plate and Souls-like games just aren't my jam. I can recall a few negative things well, like how the controls weren't as tight as I wish they were, and how some of the fights were excruciating on higher difficulties because monster-like enemies didn't telegraph themselves well enough to read. But beyond the Star Wars setting and the mix of cool abilities you had at your disposal, it didn't leave much of an impact on me. Anyways, I've rambled enough about the last game, let's talk about this one starting with the presentation. I already brought up the obvious when it comes to Jedi Survivor's performance, but it's really hard to understate the jarring frame rate, the screen tearing, and the detail rendering problems it has. In the very first cutscene, you're treated to most of these in pretty quick succession. There's a strange disparity between the frame rate in the cutscenes and the frame rate during gameplay as well, which shouldn't be the case as they aren't pre-rendered. I think they limited the cutscenes to either 30 or 24 FPS, 24 being the standard for movies and TV shows that give them their distinct look. The constant bouncing between higher and lower frame rates absolutely bothered my eyes, and it'll likely even make some people feel a little bit nauseous. The game struggles to maintain a consistent smoothness during gameplay too. These might get fixed later, but we don't know what we don't know. However, the artistry and the craftsmanship of the worlds and levels coming out of Respawn is almost unmatched. Each new location has breathtaking views full of foliage and life, and the way levels weave in and out of themselves to create natural shortcuts show a good understanding of the franchises that help shape the genre's identity. Visually, it uses the Star Wars IP very competently, as expected. From the crude, rusted materials that make up buildings and droids, to the lush, dense greens of the forests, to the burning beige sands of the deserts, the lighting and the detail in the environments make each one stand out and look lived in. There's a pretty good selection of alien species present, including some who are rarely seen and others who are brand new. Shout out to the absolute unit Turgle, who's voiced by Richard Horvitz. It also has quite a few creatures and enemy variants pulled from the extended universe material that fit nicely into the game's world. And the music! Damn, the music! 
When music director Nick Laviers and composer Stephen Barton and Gordy Hobb were putting together the score over the last three years, they must have tapped into the same force as John Williams himself. The original music in Jedi Survivor is unmistakably Star Wars. Bombastic horns, sharp strings, and a percussion section that gives it 200% make action-packed moments even more thrilling. Heavy use of bass, violins, trumpets, and woodwinds give more reflective and victorious moments a bit of nostalgic mystery and adventure. All of this is accompanied by a second set of in-universe diegetic music, made by the groups Tatran, Joywave, Alton Goon, Kaylin Ellis, and The Who. I was really confused and pleasantly surprised when I walked into a cantina for the first time and heard familiar Mongolian throat singing coming from a radio in the corner. I don't know how it fits in with Star Wars, but it does. Who knew? I'd imagine that these days, the team has access to a massive audio library to pull directly from, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to put in a ton of work themselves. The sound design perfectly encapsulates all the Star Wars goodness you know as well. Everything from the sounds of automated doors closing to wild animal howls coming from the cave around the corner need to be positioned correctly and set up with echo and reverberation the way that you would expect they would in reality. With a few minor exceptions, like the occasional muffled voice recording or bugs where audio dropped out altogether, the sound team has done a fantastic job filling the environments with intricate detail. Let's talk gameplay. Jedi Survivor is a Souls-like, and if you know what that means, you know what that means. In broad strokes, that includes massive interconnected levels with methodical combat, character customization, safe areas to rest and spend your experience in, and the chance to lose all of your unspent experience to formidable foes. But does it do the formula justice? I want to say yes in most cases. I mentioned earlier that exploration is really fun and interesting, and Jedi Survivor only adds to the base that Fallen Order laid down. Finding your way through environmental puzzles, where to jump, wall run, and grapple to with the ascension cable, is always a treat when you spot the answer in front of you. It's rarely confusing unless you're rushing headlong without a plan, but there were a few moments when I had to step back and get the bigger picture before progressing. The worlds you visit see you taking a relatively linear path through each if you only follow the main story, but there are many side quests that take you down alternate paths along the way. These come in the form of rumors. Strangers you meet along the way will ask you to complete extra objectives or explore hidden areas, rewarding extra currencies, cosmetics, and experience. Not all of them are great, but most of them will give you a pretty good challenge to overcome. Each level is interspersed with collectibles and treasure chests to find. Gone are the days of callous unpopular ponchos of many colors. The new hotness is hairstyles, full clothing sets, and the returning lightsaber and BD1 customization options. You can spend found currencies at shops for music tracks and additional minor perks, and there are also facial hair options for people that want to see Cameron Monaghan with a full beard or a handlebar mustache. The combat is mostly untouched from Fallen Order, with a few tweaks to make it feel less floaty and more intentional. You get access to most of Cal's more mundane skills from the last game, but lightsaber and force skills need to be acquired once more to build them up the way that you see fit. I've played using the dual wield and the double bladed stances, with more emphasis on the former for fast single target takedowns. Though the majority of my skill points are placed in the single survival tree, where you get things like more health and better medical stems for BD. There are a couple of major additions that come later in the story, which may change the way that you want to spend your skill points, and Respawn thankfully gives you the opportunity to reset your skills once free of charge. But I believe each time beyond the first will actually cost you experience to reset. It feels like the animation team learned from their past efforts, as enemies seem easier to read in Survivor. Some of the creature designs don't really lend themselves well to a video game fight, but these are few and far between. They'll infrequently throw in cheap shots between telegraphed attacks to catch you off guard, but when you see it once, you know to expect it again. I haven't seen any monsters quite to the scale of, say, a Dark Souls or a Bloodborne boss yet, but I think fighting something that big might be difficult to pull off in this game. The combat feels much more coherent when it's a tightly bound one-on-one -on -one against a more humanoid combatant. Group fights feel a bit more sloppy without the right set of tools. Toward the beginning of the game, you'll probably struggle with encounters of four or more enemies at the same time. Since we aren't using the Arkham or Spider-Man combat system here, each enemy has the chance to break your guard and put you in a staggered state for all the others to gang up on you. There are some challenge rooms in what Cal calls Force Tears, lifted practically one for one from other action games, which limit your skills and lightsaber stances in fights with full squadrons. They're undoubtedly difficult by nature, but don't feel too great when you've been honing your skills with a completely different setup. Once the story finally caught traction and I got some skills locked down, I really started to enjoy the game's flow between exploration and fights. 
The wide reaching vistas are excellent, the many ways you can tackle opponents is never dull, and the new faces only add to the charm found in the first game. If it weren't for some messy technical hiccups, I would be willing to say that this has been my favorite new release of this year. But until Star Wars Jedi Survivor becomes more stable, that day will have to wait. Still, it stands as a great addition to the ever-expanding galaxy of Star Wars and continues to give players who enjoy single-player titles hope for a bright future.